Hello, and welcome to GTC. My name is Jeremy Jarrett, and I'm with Michael Idell from Kinetic Vision's Modeling and Simulation Group. Kinetic Vision is an NVIDIA service delivery partner in the DGX Compute specialty. At Kinetic Vision, we work with the largest brands in the world solving product development and manufacturing challenges using digital twins. NVIDIA technologies such as RTX and DGX are crucial to our success. Today we're going to be uh, talking about a project that Mike and I have been working on for the last a few months. And uh, really what our goal here was to build was to build an intelligent CAD tool using a lot of the benefits of the SimNet solver. And so this is a brief agenda, but we're going to start off with an introduction to SimNet. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Coanda effect and, um, the, and how it's used in our design and uh, progress through the modeling of that. And then uh, finally, we'll talk a lot about how we integrated uh, our SimNet neural net into SolidWorks and, uh, and then wrap things up with some conclusions. So one of the things that we really wanted to cover with uh, using physics-informed neural networks was to incorporate them into advanced design and doing things like intelligent CAD, uh, interactive modeling, interactive, uh, um, looking interactively at the design space. And so really with the advent of machine learning and these deep neural networks, uh, we're really experiencing a big paradigm shift in computing. Uh, the development of uh, pins, as they're called, has really um, brought a shift that's focused the attention of the machine learning community on the partial differential equations that are used to govern physical phenomena. And that's really neat. Um, the combination of these uh, modern GPU systems in the uh, V100 and the A100 from NVIDIA and SimNet's PIN framework are providing a, a really big opportunity for the engineering community to solve uh, parametric design problems and really look at these design spaces interactively. And um, one of the things that a fully trained PIN can, can be used for is to instantaneously return these uh, physics-based results and then feed them into a CAD package such as SOLIDWORKS. And that's going to allow design engineers to interact directly with these uh, trained neural networks and just rapidly explore designs. One of the things that uh, uh, we did early on was, uh, you know, we took a look at SimNet in its early days and uh, solved some of the very simple problems in SimNet. So this is an example that you can um, that you can uh, get from the SimNet package. It's a three-finned heat exchanger. And uh, we solved this in SimNet version 0.1. Uh, we got really great uh, agreement with open foam results. And one of the things that we really loved was it was really easy um, if you were familiar with um, neural networks and were doing, already doing some simulation work, it was really easy to get started with the examples and really start using uh, physics-informed neural networks right away. Some of the uh, interesting applications that SimNet can be applied to really uh, range. You know, SimNet's interactivity when you know, pulling results from the design space, uh, as well as um, how it trains, really make it suitable for a wide variety of problems. Both problems that can be solved by you know, classical commercial uh, physics codes, as well as interesting problems that may not be able to be solved by those codes. Uh, SimNet uh, you know, has a architecture that's uh, built on uh, NVIDIA hardware and it's really scalable anywhere from a single modern GPU all the way up to a cluster of DGXs. The SimNet solver is built on top of the TensorFlow framework and then uh, there's capabilities to bring in uh, or produce different types of geometry as well as um, you know, solve different types of, uh, uh, different types of uh, physics informed neural networks based on different governing differential equations. And then once you have your solution, you're gonna be interacting with it um, you know, while you're solving with things like TensorBoard and using VTK and ParaView to really look at your results. Now I'm going to turn it over to Mike here to talk a little bit about the Coanda effect. All right. <clears throat> Just going to start out here with a little bit of the history of the Coanda effect and, and Henri Coanda. So Henri Coanda was a Romanian inventor uh, who worked in aeronautics over 100 years ago. He really started out in his main field of work was developing experimental aircraft early in the days of aviation. Um, he detailed out uh, the Coenda effect and was actually issued a patent by the French government in 1934. So per DJ Tritton in his book, Physical Fluid Dynamics, the Coenda effect is described as the tendency for flows to attach to walls or to one another. So on the bottom right, you can see two different images of multi-element airfoils. Um, and the flap that's shown 
in the very bottom right image actually shows a jet of air flowing around the flap which induces a pressure gradient normal to the flap itself and helps maintain attached flow. This is important especially for aircraft because uh, that attached flow can help maintain proper performance from a lift coefficient standpoint of the actual full multi-element system. Yeah, and these, uh, the quant effect in reality is used in a lot of different industrial applications. So many you may almost you know, not recognize it, but it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, it, it's used in material handling, intralogistics, manufacturing, and uh, commonly used in an implementation called an air knife, which can be used for drying, dust management, uh, material processing, and things like pneumatic sorting. And one, one particular manufacturing process in which the Coanda effect has been investigated is in the galvanization process. Galvanization is characterized by a steel strip that's pulled through a molten zinc bath and then bathed with an air knife, usually with uh, nitrogen gas. That's called a gas wiping process uh, to help maintain the proper thickness of zinc applied to that steel strip. Um, there's been noted in, in the past edge overcoating where the edges of the steel strip have uh, more zinc uh, than the middle of the strip, as well as checkerboarding, which was attributed to different hydrodynamic instabilities that the jet experienced due to the motion of the steel strip. Uh, researchers have investigated coanda nozzles as one way to help direct the flow um, downward uh, towards the uh, bottom of the steel strip and also maintain stability of the actual nitrogen jet so that you mitigate both the edge overcoating as well as the checkerboarding pattern noticed. And this is really the application that kind of forms the motivation for the nozzle that we're going to be taking a look at on subsequent slides. So just to give an overview of SimNet, SimNet is a physics-informed neural network framework that's used alongside NVIDIA's GPU capabilities. Uh, physics-informed neural networks were really and from a concrete standpoint, developed by Raisi, Perticaris, and Carniadakis. Um, in conjunction with that physics-informed neural network uh, framework that's in SimNet is a novel vector potential formulation of the 3D Navier-Stokes equations uh, detailed in the, the publication uh, shown on the bottom right. One of the keys to actually uh, taking this physics-informed neural network approach combined with this novel Navier-Stokes formulation is a loss function uh, that incorporates the actual mathematics of the partial differential equation of interest and actually continuously treats their derivatives using something called automatic differentiation. So, many neural networks are supervised or they have uh, data that they are used to train. Uh, in the case of a physics-informed or physics-driven neural network, this is an unsupervised process and all of the information of the physics is contained within the loss function and that loss function is based upon the partial differential equation of interest. So SimNet is a physics-driven or physics-informed neural network. <clears throat> the loss function in SimNet uh, is really following the same formulation as the Ricey, Perticaris, and Carniadakis work. So it starts out with a conservation law of the form shown on the top equation on this slide, where n is some nonlinear differential operator that depends on the partial differential equation of interest, and you're solving this over a domain. In this case, it's denoted by omega. And if you have a transient problem, it's in the time range zero to t. So the loss function shown at the bottom as L residual contains the information uh, within the actual partial differential equation um, via the function f described on the very bottom equation on this slide. This residual or this loss function is minimized typically, uh, for instance, within SimNet uh, using the adaptive moment or atom optimizer. So just to lay a little bit of the groundwork for the physics that we're expecting with that uh, galvanization nozzle, that subsonic nozzle we discussed earlier, uh, the laminar jet physics and structure has been well studied uh, in DJ Tritton's book that we have a reference for in the back of this, uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, there's a nice section about 2D laminar jets. The equations that govern these types of phenomenon are shown here, the conservation of mass and conservation of momentum partial differential equations. So these can be solved analytically and you can achieve a closed form analytical solution of the form at the bottom left. That solution is plotted and different profiles of velocity are shown at different stations in that contour. 
Additionally, one thing of interest specifically within the context of the Coenda effect is what is the influence of a pressure gradient on the conservation of momentum equation in this 2D laminar system? So instead of going back to an analytical approach that's based on the similarity method, here we're going to use SimNet and its parametric design capability to explore different radii which would induce different pressure gradients within the system. So just to provide an overview of the actual geometry that we're going to be uh, focusing on with our SIM network, this is a 2D representation of a subsonic nozzle like those used in the galvanization process. Um, so all of the shapes in this domain were actually created using SimNet's internal geom module. The boundary conditions that were specified are as shown in the, the bottom right of this slide. So the red no-slip walls where you apply a zero velocity condition. The velocity inlet is in the green, and then the black perimeter is a pressure outlet where you essentially have a zero gauge pressure condition. The velocity inlet is very important and how you specify that can help improve convergence of the, of the training process. The velocity profile that we specified for this laminar case was a parabolic velocity inlet as shown in the bottom left of this slide. The specific network architecture that was chosen for this was based upon both the SimNet user's guide as well as guidance from NVIDIA de developers. The modified Fourier architecture uh, was selected for this work and can help avoid some of the low frequency bias seen in full, fully connected networks, especially for fluid flow problems. The actual snippet of code that we used within this, uh, the, the Python setup file for SimNet is shown below. One of the important um, things that you need to think about when you're first setting up uh, a SimNet uh, case is how to non-dimensionalize the domain so that you don't wind up with any disparities in weight values. You want most of the weights to actually be between zero and one. One way to achieve this is by using a Reynolds number scaling to a fairly normalized domain. Um, there are some publications that discuss this and uh, one of them, reference eight in the back, provides a good overview of which length scale to choose to, as the non-dimensionalization factor in your, in your problem of interest. Here, we took the same approach that's detailed out in many of the SIMNET examples, and we, uh, in the non-dimensional domain, we set density to U velocity and D values to one, and solve for an effective viscosity to match the Reynolds number of a, a full-scale problem for an industrial problem of interest. The point cloud density is also something that's subject to user input. Uh, the sampling or the batch sampling of your physical domain is, is up to your specification. So the way that it was approached here for this 2D nozzle is that we started out with a background, which is shown in the, on the bottom of the top right image. And then we also added in a high resolution region within what would be called the nozzle's potential core where you experience a lot of velocity gradients. Each snippet of code that generated each one of these, these batch samplings is shown at the left. One of the important uh, aspects of training the models is to make sure that as the model is being trained, uh, the progression makes sense. The loss curve progression makes sense over the iterations that you've run this, as well as the learning rate. So one way to do this is by using TensorBoard. The SimNet user guide actually details this out very nicely. And these are just two examples of cases that, uh, of, of both the loss function and the learning rate for a parametric case that was explored uh, of this 2D nozzle. And it's, it's very similar to how you would monitor convergence of residuals in traditional physics-based codes like Fluent. So to start off, we selected a baseline, simple 2D case with no parameterized geometry as our, our beginning point for this uh, Coanda jet exploration. It looked very qualitatively correct from the standpoint of the jet theory presented in the previous slides. Uh, there was slow convergence noted for this case uh, throughout the training. And one of the, the culprits of this potentially is the fact that there was a sharp geometric discontinuity at each trailing edge of the nozzle. It was thought that potentially adding a radius of these uh, to the edges of the nozzle could help speed up convergence, and in fact it did, and it was a factor of approximately three. 
So qualitatively, we did a comparison, and quantitatively, we also made a comparison between uh, the commercial code Fluent. So in the bottom left, the velocity contour is generated by the Fluent solution that was set up identically from a geometry and also a physics standpoint as a SimNet shown at the bottom right. They look very similar. One thing to note is that the velocity contours in the SimNet trained neural network did exhibit some non-zero velocities in the outboard sections of the jet. Um, this is quantitatively compared in the next slide. So from a quantitative standpoint, we compared the Fluent and the SimNet results at two different stations uh, downstream of the nozzle exit. One, a couple of things to note. Peak velocities in the actual Fluent jet are slightly higher, whereas the outboard velocities are, are zero for Fluent and non-zero for SimNet. So overall, a pretty good prediction, I'd say, by uh, the physics-informed neural network that we trained with SimNet. Um, some discrepancies that we think that we can improve upon in the future. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we took these results and integrated them uh, back into CAD with SOLIDWORKS. Um, if we looked at how we defined the parametric geometry for SimNet, uh, you can see that we added a radius to both trailing edges. And then we took advantage of one of the trailing edges to um, change that radius as part of our parametric study. And you can see in the lower right hand corner by increasing that radius um, you change the pressure gradient at that exit and that's uh, one of the parts of the Coanda effect that we're going to be uh, taking advantage of in this design. Um, as, the, uh, as the radius gets larger it will begin to look more like a flat plate. As the radius is smaller um, it will produce a exponentially increasing normal pressure gradient. And then um, you also have to take into account that uh, as that radius changes, the surface area over which the pressure gradient occurs is going to uh, take a, uh, have an influence on the jet angle. So if we look at our results out of SimNet and uh, retrieve them uh, over the design space of the changing radius, you can see indeed, um, as we look at the velocity contours, that that uh, jet angle changes as you increase the radius, and it is a, um, a nonlinear relationship. So now that we have some results coming out of SimNet, it's time to uh, look at how do, we, how do we integrate a SimNet with SolidWorks. So this just shows the flow uh, that we designed uh, for interacting with SimNet. Uh, we start off in SolidWorks and the user is going to specify this trailing edge radius. Uh, we pass that value through Python um, in, into um, uh, an interface with SimNet. Python is going to retrieve um, the data from the, the, from the neural network and the results for that specified radius in the, in the parametric run. Um, and then we actually do some post-processing in Python also to uh, take a look at the uh, velocity profiles and calculate uh, an average jet angle and then uh, relay that jet angle back into SolidWorks. So this is the design for the air knife that we chose. Um, on the right hand side you can see a, a normal commercially available air knife and then on the left um, we we designed an air knife that takes advantage of this coanda effect on the bottom surface. And as you interact with the CAD model, well, really what you do is just like uh, you know, using SOLIDWORKS on an everyday basis, you're going to uh, select your sketch, you're going to uh, you know, change, the, change the radius value of that uh, lower trailing edge, and, um, and then that's going to adjust the solid model. And on the right hand side, what you can see is um, we're showing the results at each different radius as we cycle through that design space. Um, we've, uh, as a convenience, imported a contour plot of the results at, at, that, um, at that design point uh, so that we can then uh, really see how well we're, how well we're doing. And then uh, modeled a, a representation of the jet and, um, and then we apply the jet angle that's retrieved and calculated from the network to that, uh, to that red body that we're showing as the jet angle. And so uh, what this would allow is the designer the ability to come in and uh, adjust uh, their radius to achieve the, the jet angle that they want in the design. So here we've got the assembly. Uh, we're going to move into the, the component where the, the trailing edge is defined. 
and then we're going to adjust that radius. Uh, we'll turn on the jet angle body here so that we can see the jet. And then as you watch, we go up and click on um, our uh, button that fires off the SOLIDWORKS macro. And then you saw that jet angle change. Now we're going to move into a side view here and do this again. And if you watch that jet angle carefully, as we switch to uh, a new radius, um, and then we uh, push that SOLIDWORKS automation, we go out and retrieve the information, we bring it back and adjust the jet angle. And you can see that really with, within just a couple seconds, uh, we get a result back, allowing the designer to um, really understand you know, what direction that jet is as it's coming out of the, out of the nozzle. So we were really pleased with these results, and um, in you know it was uh, it was really a success um, you know based on what we first set out to do. Uh, but we have some next steps. So um, you know really this is a, more of a a bit of a pilot project, and I would say it's not ready for prime time uh, with the you know designers using it on an everyday basis. And really, what you're going to see is in the future um, the the, uh, the the software vendors are going to integrate this themselves. So, you know, this would be, you know, if, if, we're, if, if we're building this here at Kinetic Vision, this would be a custom tool for a special purpose. But a few of the things that we want to do is we want to increase those parametric variables. So probably adjust the jet opening and then also maybe the input flow um, to create a more robust design space based on, you know, three variables instead of one. Uh, also uh, train a 3D model instead of just a 2D model uh, utilizing, uh, you know, the one of the DGX A100 machines to, to train out that model and um, convert our, our macro in SOLIDWORKS to a SOLIDWORKS plugin that has an official user input UI just to make that user interface a little more slick. And then um, in addition, we want to directly access the neural network. Right now, the SimNet application itself is doing some of the data handling with the network and that uh, creates a little bit of a delay. Uh, but there are methods within the SimNet framework to um, use a class to access that network directly, which would require uh, faster results querying. So those are some of the things that we've got planned for the future. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about the, you know, the conclusions of this project and, and kind of you know, how it all worked together. So um, the model was trained uh, using a Tesla V100 GPUs. We trained on a, a, a DGX1, which uh, has eight V100s. And uh, this uh, parametric model required about 55 hours of training time. So that's you know, what you could expect for a 2D model of this you know, kind of complexity. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, Microsoft uh, Azure supports uh, V100s and A100s in preview right now. And, um, and those uh, particular resources, the, the V100 um, instance, which has eight cards, is available on demand for $22 an hour. And the uh, A100 with eight cards is available on demand for about $27 an hour. And um, one thing to note is that as you train with the A100, uh, um, SimNet is enabled to use the um, new uh, TF32 method for training, which really should be about three times faster than training on the V100s. So um, just a few uh, tips for you know, when you're um, you know, when you're working with SimNet and you're uh, developing a model. So, you know, first of all, and this is really for any kind of um, any kind of simulation work that you're doing, it's always great to start off with the fundamental physics, understand the physics of your problem, um, leverage some textbook cases, maybe support the validation of your solution with some simple uh, spreadsheet calculations. That just kind of makes sure that you know you're going on the right track um, as you're progressing through your model. Uh, also, very, very helpful to have uh, a good uh, traditional, uh, you know, commercial validation code available. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be commercial. Uh, we used uh, Fluent, we used OpenFoam, and we've also used a, a code called SU2 um, to, to validate some of our simulations. So it's always great to checkpoint along the way and make sure that your, um, that your, your SimNet simulation is matching up with a, another uh, trusted code. Um, thirdly, uh, start simple. Uh, you don't want to get into a situation where you've uh, built up this highly complex geometry, spent weeks and weeks and weeks, and, um, and then you start solving your model and, um, and, and you're having really long solution times and you're really not sure why. Um, so start with simple geometries, simple straightforward boundary conditions, get your model up and training quickly, 
And then as you understand the sensitivities of that model, uh, you can you know, avoid a lot of rework by just starting simple, getting the model running, and then come back and add complexity later. Um, also, uh, you really want to watch out for areas where there's challenging physics. So if there's, um, you know, like Mike talked about before, if there's discontinuities in that model um, or discontinuities in the geometry or the boundary conditions, uh, that can increase your training times. Uh, basically, you know, where you have uh, well-behaved physics, your, 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 your training times are going to be faster, and where you have very challenging physics, uh, the training times are going to, take, uh, are going to be longer. And um, with post-processing, uh, Paraview, uh, Python, and Matplotlib are definitely your friends, um, and you're going to be using those to, um, to view your results. And then uh, being familiar with uh, uh, other machine learning tools. So once again, TensorBoard is a tool you'll be using a lot to make sure you know, that you're monitoring your training and you're getting good convergence along the way. So uh, there are also some trade-offs with using a tool like SimNet. So SimNet is a new technology. Um, it's uh, not even at version 1.0 yet, um, but it has you know, great potential. So you just have to um, understand where some of the limitations are. So as far as some of the pros go, um, you know, you're getting real-time results from a parametric model. That is very powerful and um, can lead to uh, a, a lot of really interesting types of solutions. Uh, you can do things like inverse simulation. So, um, you know, uh, most traditional codes are really only going to offer you a forward simulation type technique, but SimNet can offer you uh, a situation where you can uh, really look at uh, the uh, end state that you want and then steer the input var and find out what the input variables will get you there. Um, it's highly scalable, so uh, the SimNet's training performance is nearly linear. Uh, with as many GPUs as you can throw at it from a single card all the way up to a cluster. And, um, and then it has a great meshless implementation. So um, since you're defining your geometry with a point cloud, um, you're not going to get stuck in these situations where um, you, know, you have to fit a mesh in a really tight area or you, have, uh, you, know, uh, you don't have well-formed elements. Uh, the only things you have to watch out for is you have to make sure that your point cloud is defined appropriately to capture all the details of that geometry and then also capture the details of you know, the physics in the area of concern. Um, some of the watchouts. So um, you know, there are uh, really um, limited limitations in building out parametric geometries right now. Parameterized geometry is um, you know, currently only supported in the, in the geom uh, feature of SimNet and, and that's kind of you know, using uh, scripting to do uh, basic Boolean operations. Um, so right now, you, you know, you have to keep parameterized geometries pretty simple, but uh, as, uh, as, as the features come in, that is something that uh, will be addressed. And, um, you know, the, the problem setup is very manual. So if you're used to using a code like Fluent um, that's, you know, been around for, you know, more than 20 years, um, you know, you may miss some of the conveniences that are offered by um, a mature code like that. The, the, the problem setup is is fairly manual and um, you know there, there are things that you're going to have to uh, kind of you know uh, get through from a code standpoint. Um, something else to watch out for is um, you know there are definitely um, you know uh, sensitivities to certain types of problems so you might get slower training convergence where there's um, you know geom geometric or boundary condition discontinuities so you need to you need to watch out for those. And then um, the, the post-processing is also an area that's somewhat manual. Um, you know, you're going to be using tools like VTK and Paraview, um, but you may need to get into um, you know, uh, some custom Python and, and Matplotlib. Um, we definitely found an area in order to get you know, really nice looking contour plots, uh, you know, you, we really had to fiddle with the, you know, triangulating those point clouds and remapping the results. And, um, and so that, that's an area that you may spend a little extra time. Once again, as time goes on, um, you know, these things are going to become easier to do. So, um, and the great news is, is that, you know, uh, we're using SimNet uh, version 0.2, um, but, uh, you know, SimNet has a whole roadmap and the team is releasing, you know, approximately uh, quarterly and there are a lot of great new features coming. So if you're interested in, um, you know, starting to use a tool like this, um, you know, there are a few, uh, a few limitations and a few things that you need to figure out on your own, but the community is growing and there are a lot of really great features coming uh, down the line. So uh, with regards to 
you know, future applications. Uh, you know, what does this kind of tool really offer um, from an industry standpoint? So one, you know, use case we covered today was, you know, what you'd call intelligent CAD. Designers interactively understanding the performance of their designs and perhaps using inverse simulation to predict design inputs um, necessary to get the response that they want. Uh, but there are a few other things that you could look at too. Real-time predictive control systems. So, um, you know, controlling that jet um, a little more um, in the real world, um, you know, with the closed loop sensing system. And, um, but replacing that sensing system with a, like a closed loop simulation system. Uh, dynamic prediction of structural deformations, uh, real-time compensation for thermal deformations and stresses. And this is something that's a really hot topic in the metal additive manufacturing space right now. Highly complex geometries. So uh, meshless simula simulation is uh, especially great for things like uh, porous media, really unstructured geometries that have a lot of complexity, nooks and crannies. Um, using a, a meshless technique where you're really just map mapping a point cloud in there can really enable a lot of great things in, uh, in geometries that are traditionally very difficult to simulate. And then uh, digital twins. So, you know, SimNet can be used to, uh, you know, create a, a really a, a lightweight um, real-time uh, simulation that you could then put inside of a larger system simulation um, in, in, in a tool like Omniverse. So really some, uh, some neat future applications. Uh, SimNet is a, a really an amazing technology, and we're really excited to uh, see what the future holds for it. So we uh, reference a lot of papers throughout this presentation. This just covers some of those references. And uh, thank you again for joining us at GTC 21. And uh, please feel free to reach out with any questions. If you're interested in computer vision applications in the retail space, or generally interested in synthetic training data, please join us in session 31538. Look forward to seeing you there.